Hello everyone. In today's video, I'm going to be covering a topic that I find super interesting. I decided to make a video that basically lists what is a reasonable investment versus favoritism and where is that line really crossed, in my opinion. All of these considerations are for the highest difficulty that the game offers and we'll use a couple of examples of units that I've seen actually fall under these categories. I want to start off with the positive example of something that I don't believe is favoritism, but a reasonable investment. I've actually spoken about this before in one of my other videos, but I believe that Cyril in Three Houses is one of the classic cases of a good unit hidden behind other qualities that you otherwise would not see just because of the class he's in and his bases. Cyril is actually pretty good given that he can get point blank volley with just a simple month of tutoring, if you recruit him at the beginning of the month and as quickly as you can, allowing him to get to C plus with bows and having point blank volley. Now, point blank volley is basically a brave weapon with higher hit, but the key to this is actually to give Cyril a steel bow plus. If you do three houses on maddening, you know how valuable steel bows actually are because of the increased chip damage from curved shots and other longer ranged attacks as well. So having a forged steel bow around is actually very good, and you're probably going to have one anyway by this point of the game. Since Cyril basically two taps anybody with point blank volley, it doesn't matter if he outspeeds him or not. Cyril being a growth unit because of his aptitude does increase his growth slightly, but I'm not really going to try to sell you off on this. All that you need to know is that his performance is basically tied to his combat arts and how his stat distribution is allocated in terms of strength, speed, defense and skill there is however a downside that if you pick him up later he will be leveled up in the commoner class which has horrible bases so don't do this try to pick him up as quickly as possible to try to get him online and activate it later on as the game progresses he also maintains his statuses by being able to access the best classes in the game giving him that reasonable investment does not really constitute in my opinion as favoritism it's more of looking at a good situation with weaponry that you already possess anyways and you're just allocating the resource to the right unit in order to push them forward to do more. Now on to a negative example. Anna and Fire Emblem Engage. Now I know what you're going to say that no, Anna's fantastic, she does so much damage, she's really good at end game, she scales really well. And that's all fine and dandy. You can really make any unit work in Engage. I actually do like Engage a lot because of that. But let's take an objective look at Anna. For starters, I'm going to list the things that she needs in order to reach the class that most people think that she's the best in, which is Mage Knight. Five levels, a second seal, a master seal, Mikaya, setting up kills, a Milky Way, and protecting her the entire time. Even if you decide that all of this is really worth it, let's go ahead and take a look at an internal level Anna 20 as a Mage Knight. The notable stats for combat in this class I'd say are magic, dexterity, and speed, because we're not really expecting to take hits here anyway, so those stand at 20 magic, 21 dex, and 21 speed on average rounding up. I took Clan, who is widely regarded as not the best unit ever, but perfectly serviceable, and his stats in the same class look something like 15 magic, 22 dex, and 23 speed. Right now, I will concede that there is a significant magical difference. That translates to roughly 10 damage on enemies. But here's the thing, isn't Celica also available beforehand too? And in the same manner that we go just fix Anna's speed, not that 21 is bad at all by any means, can't we just fix Clan's magic? All of that, and I didn't even really touch upon the point that more likely than not, the five magic will be overkill on the majority of enemies. So is there really any reason to go above and beyond, for speed as well too, because you really only need enough to do the threshold, if you're meeting those thresholds necessary for less investment. Is this indeed a reliable resource? Or is this favoritism creeping in? I will concede that once you look at her performance towards the end of the game, yes, she will probably beat Clan by some significant points. But even then, somebody can just walk in and be like, Pandreo exists? Why would you sink all these resources to get a unit that can do a job that other two units can do right then and there with less resources? Going back to a positive take, one unit that I really like, this is actually one of my favorite units, is Homer from Fire Emblem 5. 
And his whole gimmick is that he comes at a point in time that the game is kind of almost halfway through or the chapters have been pretty significantly difficult and he comes at a pretty low level. One look at this guy and you'd probably just be like, nah, it's not worth it. But there are a couple of things that Homer has that actually make him really, really good. For starters, he has Paragon. Any and all investment that goes into him is doubled and leveling him up isn't actually that hard. He has a follow-up critical coefficient multiplier of 5, which means that any one of his second attacks will more likely than not become a crit and will automatically become a crit if he has at least 20 crit on a unit. But even then, you would sit there and be like, okay, I really don't need this because I already have my combats met by other mages as well. Why would Homer be any different? Homer actually has two things going for him that not many other units can replicate. Number one, is actually the fact that Homer's promotion gains from Bard to Sage are basically one of the strongest in the games, if not outright the strongest. Early promoting him can keep him up to almost the same level as Asbel up to that point, which is wild given how powerful Asbel is. Now granted, he doesn't have Asbel's personal tone, but he does have another very interesting niche. Homer after promoting can use Nosferatu at base, meaning that his combination along with the Wrath manual that you got earlier can create a unit that can get attack, counter attack with an automatic crit with Nosferatu and heal completely up. There are other units that can replicate this. However, Homer is one of the easiest ones to activate or get online because of the combination of Paragon, pretty good bulk and stats, and also his promotion gains. Even if you didn't go this route, his follow up critical multiplier of 5 is more than enough to carry him in a game where magic is super powerful and the quality of enemy units is pretty bad to begin with. This is a case of the minimal investment of just deploying Homer, maybe giving him wrath or not, but actually feeding him a couple of kills will allow him to snowball into a combat unit that can replace another one. And thinking about how Thracia works with the fatigue system, sometimes it is good to bench Asbel for a later chapter and then just slot Homer right in so he can take over that. Or in the case of an Iron Man, you lost a unit, well, Homer's here for you. Now my piece de resistance of this episode today is something I'm going to call the Mia argument. Mia in Radiant Dawn is a unit that I think is severely overrated. A lot of people talk about how good she is and you just got to give her some resources and she'll take off like crazy and kill everything. So I decided to take an objective look at how this works out. I took a thread on Serenus Forest that has basically listed the average stats that you'll see for hard mode Radiant Dawn. I took part three and I started analyzing those stats to be able to compare them to what Mia could perform at. For starters, let's take 3P, which is her joining chapter. She has a base 17 attack, and let's take the 9 Might from the Steel Sword for a massive 26 combined attack. I'm going to consider the Steel Sword over the Wood Dao because I don't like gambling on crits and I don't think anybody should either too, so let's just look at objective damage that can be done. Most enemies will take anywhere from 11 damage times 2, having about 40 HP points, meaning that at least two rounds of combat will be required to kill them. The generals and halberdiers she fares much worse against, and she's really only one rounding the mages. To be fair though, even Ike can't one round everything with his base speed. Had he had 24, he could have, except for the sword masters. But in the event that Ike gains one point of speed, he can reach that threshold and proceed to one round the majority of enemies on the map. The real difference here is that the bulk is significantly different with Ike, with him surviving 4-5 to five rounds of combat versus Mia's 2. But, even if you were to think, well don't compare him to Ike, Titania has basically almost the same attack stat, almost the same defenses, and almost the same speed as Ike, on a horse, with a better weapon type in terms of might. Whatever Ike is doing, consider Titania relatively similar in terms of combat potential. And even then, if you think Titan is a different league, let's look at Shinon, who can actually double everything in the chapter and do a whopping 12 points of damage more on everything except the Swords Masters, which he doesn't double. Let's look at 3-1, and it's more of the same. With a lot more 1-2 range, meaning she can't really counter a lot of enemies on the map, to make matters worse, there's a bunch of generals that pop up on the bottom right, which she can do a total of 2 to 3 damage to, if you gave her two level ups on the previous chapter, and we're rounding this up, the Halberdia she fares a little bit better against, doing 8 damage on average times 2, and the Warrior is about 12 times 2. 
In this chapter, Ike, even without the speed level, is one rounding everything but the boss and the generals. And again, much better bulk. Shinon can also double everything in the chapter, pretty much, and do a whopping 12 points of damage more. He also can tank pretty much everything with his incredible base defense. He also can retaliate against said ranged threats and kill them, which is something Mia can't do. Titania falling in the similar category as Ike once again, however she can't double due to her speed being a little bit lower. Another good thing is that Shinon just received the crossbow, meaning that he can tank about the same amount of hits with Ike to be able to soften up units for enemy face since nobody's really one rounding the generals on average anyways. Now, we're going to 3-2. This is where the turning point comes, where everybody says that the investment is here and ready to pay off. If you took the energy drop from the Dawn Brigade or from the Crimeans and passed it over here to give to Mia for whatever reason, then this is where you would use it. Now, let's disregard the mages because we all know how difficult it is to kill mages in Radiant Dawn. Are you serious? The Dragon Lords in this chapter have on average 20 to 21 defense. The generals are now sitting at 24 to 25. Your average paladin is 18. Assuming we've given Mia the energy drop, and we bust her up immediately to level 20 with all the bonus experience, a Milky Way, and give her a forged steel sword with two might, we're now sitting at a massive 37 attack. So let's just walk across that river after five turns, or we can rescue drop her and put her in range of only one enemy, because she can only survive one per turn, and do about 38 damage to these units on the high end. Effectively, not one rounding a single one of them. And before somebody brings up the Worm Slayer, Ike can also use it too. Now, Ike with one speed level up at base strength with Etard, his personal weapon, does one less damage. One thing people love to say though is that Mia is a great abuser of bonus experience. So, by that same logic, wouldn't it make more sense to actually give Ike the energy drop so he can cap his strength faster and we just bonus XP his speed? Or is the argument that Ike is so good he doesn't really need this, so it's better to use it on her? But what about Titania, who's just about the same problem as Ike on the fringe of doubling, with the same issue regarding speed and also being able to cap attack faster? Or what about the bonus experience we could have invested into Shinan to just outright promote him and kill everything while softening up every single enemy with no fear of death. And also costing less bonus experience to promote him since he's so close to the promotion value anyways. After this, I didn't want to proceed any further with my analysis on the terms of stats for a couple of reasons. Based on the amount of 1-2 ranges only getting higher, the difficulty of the terrain only getting more complicated with the flyers dominating and the horses dominating a lot more for these Grail mercenary chapters, Along with the fact that the stat-wise, defensive values only continue to increase at about 1-2 points on average for the common enemy, it really didn't make sense to keep on looking at stats. And before somebody says that the game gets a lot easier for her after this, since the Grail Mercenaries have a total of 11 chapters in Part 3, I just want to point out that being a carry for 3 of them means that you're being carried for roughly 30% of that time. Barring an early promotion of Mia, she just cannot contribute in part 3 in the same manner that other units can with the same resources allocated. I will agree that True Blade Mia is pretty solid in most aspects. She has good dodge tanking capabilities if you want to take Ike support and run with it. It can also patch up her strength a little bit due to the fire affinity. But again, you're taking away a better support from Ike who can basically pair up with Soren or Oscar for more avoid. She is pretty powerful in the tower due to the class, but even then, the double bowl blows Vekati out of the water in such an absurd manner that Shinan has 1-3 range with the 22 might weapon that gives plus 3 attack. Har is still Har, existing and dominating the game anyways, and any bonus experience you do to patch up his speed will only make him kill more things, and Titania is on the same level as Ike in this regard. Even if you didn't consider all that, Ike is still probably the best combat unit in the game for part 4. This is not to say that Mia is a bad unit. I don't think she is. I think she's perfectly serviceable. 
and I do believe that some investment can go to her that don't really take away from any other units in the Grail Mercenaries. Something like a Steel Sword is fine because Ike already has Etard anyway. But when we're frivolously tossing around stat boosters, resources from the Dawn Brigade, setting up kills, early promoting her, it puts into the question if this is really, truly a reasonable investment or if it's favoritism. The fact of the matter remains, no matter how it's being spun, giving that much favoritism to Mia only brings her up to par with some of the better units in the Grail Mercs, who can already snowball even harder with those same resources. To end on a more positive note, I'll give an example of what I believe is actually the best resource allocation unit in the series of Fire Emblem. I believe that Farina is the best unit of how to use your resources properly on a unit. Farina's cost to activate is the following. Three javelins, roughly, a pure water, the 20k gold, an Elysian whip that comes in that same chapter, a Milky Way, and the Aphis drops. Now you're probably sitting here and being like, that's a lot of things. Out of all of those, I would say the only one that really is contested is the Aphis drops. And you can even do without that, you don't really need it. I just like to use it because she's right there, has the potential to grow, and can benefit the most from this. So how does this work? If you give Farina a pure water and a couple of javelins and go to the top right side, she can basically fight the horde of low level light mages that do no damage to her and just body them continuously until you level up non-stop. Once you've leveled up your fill and including killing the purge guy who does minimal damage to her after the pure water anyway, you can then visit the village down south, grab the Elysian whip, instantly promote and become a very viable combat unit that also has flight until the rest of the game. Now you would say 20k gold is still a pretty steep price, and I will agree, it is pretty steep. But luckily enough, the question I really pose here is how much do you like dart? And I know that that's a strange question to ask, but the truth is by selling darts ocean seal, you can actually justify the price to buy Farina. It's almost like a one-to-one -one thing. If you want to use Dart, it's going to be a little bit harder to buy Farina. But if you prefer Farina, then you're not really losing out on much. And albeit a Berserker is pretty good, I really don't think that it's better than what Farina has to offer. Particularly because you do get another Berserker that is much better in the form of Hawkeye. And Farina is a flyer with pretty good solid combat including high resistance, which means she can deal with a lot of the high-powered mages and Valkyries towards the end of the game. Ultimately, I think Farina is really well done because of the fact that all of the solutions to her problems are in the same chapter. The Elysian Whip that exists there, she is not competing with for anybody else because at this point, you've either promoted whoever you wanted to with an Elysian Whip or... You have so many flyers that you don't even know which one to pick and you're not even going to buy her anyway, so it doesn't matter. But if you do go the route of picking her up, right then and there, her promotion, a couple of javelins and pure water will ensure that she does a fantastic job and allow you to have a really solid unit. And this is what I believe is probably the best definition of a reasonable investment. Now granted, everybody's going to play Fire Emblem however they want. I'm not telling you not to do that. But what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of encouragement to actually look objectively at what these units have to contribute and how they affect your gameplay moving forward. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe. Leave down in the comments below what you think about this and what units you believe also act in this category of being reasonable investment or of being favoritism. And you guys have a wonderful day.